Next Sunday is an important Sunday in the life of our church because uh, it's homecoming Sunday. All the children will be moved up to their next a class or grade, and I know some of the kids have been in school a couple of weeks now, uh, but also there are lots of adult classes, some of them that are starting next week, but we have three hours of adult classes beginning at 815 with an open Bible study, and so as we get ready for the fall, as we move out of summer, I would challenge you all to think about trying some of our adult Sunday school classes, the Bible study at 815, uh, and getting more engaged uh, in the, the life of the church as we get ready for the fall. There's a new class for parents and uh, uh, couples. It will be at 1045 called Life in the Balance. And uh, this will take the sermon topic and then unpack it into your everyday lives. So I'll put that out there because next Sunday will be an exciting Sunday uh, in the life of our church. Uh, Join me for a word of prayer, if you would. Loving God, open our hearts and minds to hear your word today. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I feel the need to begin this morning by addressing what happened yesterday in Charlottesville. My wife is from Virginia. Uh, She grew up in that community just outside of Charlottesville. She went to UVA. And so I was watching what took place yesterday in Charlottesville with great uh, shock and, and, and sadness. And it occurred to me while all that craziness was going on that that was actually the place where Thomas Jefferson wrote the words to the Declaration of Independence, which, if you remember, say, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, all people are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among those life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Great irony that those words were written in that place, and that was where that hatred took place yesterday. We should pray for those who were hurt, injured, and for the families who lost loved ones yesterday. This month marks, as Tom said, the 10 year anniversary for me here at Woodmont, which is hard to believe. Uh, I came to Nashville uh, in August of 2007. I was 27 years old, I was single. And uh, to be honest with you, I wondered what I'd gotten myself into. But you guys took a chance on a young preacher for which I will always be grateful. And now my life is very different. I'm married with a daughter and two sons and life changes every step of the way. What I'd like to do this morning before we begin a new sermon series next week on the tough questions of Jesus. Jesus asked lots of questions throughout the gospels. What I'd like to do this morning is reflect upon these past 10 years and share with you 10 basic lessons that I've learned. I've always believed in what Socrates said, that the unexamined life is not worth living. And so I think that all of us do well to examine our lives, to ask ourselves, what have we learned? How have we grown? How have we changed? How have we matured? What would we do differently if we could do it all over again? So these are 10 lessons that I have learned, all of them grounded in scripture to some degree. Some of these I learned quickly, others it took me a longer time to learn, but I want to share them with you today uh, on this uh, month uh, that I kind of observe and celebrate 10 years here at Woodmont. Lesson number one is this, God is real and God is faithful. What does that mean? It means that God does not leave us or abandon us or give us more than we can handle in life. It doesn't mean that life is always easy. It doesn't mean that life is always fair. Isaiah says, those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. When I arrived here 10 years ago, this church had been through some difficult times. A lot of people had left. Many were hurting and were angry, many for good reason. And then they called a 27-year-old to be the senior pastor, which made a lot of other people hurt and angry. (laughs) And I knew Woodmont had been through some tough times, but it really took me actually getting here to experience how tough that had been and to understand it and to appreciate it. The membership had dwindled. The budget was small. There was significant debt that was hampering the, the, the ministry and the mission and the outreach. We've now paid that off, thankfully. But there were people who rightfully asked, how can this young guy lead us? He looks like he's in high school. 
He's not even married. What does he know about life? What does he know about faith? And I knew at that point that it was going to take a while to get this church to a better place. And there were many days and nights when I prayed to God for strength and for courage to give me the vision to look to the future and to not dwell on the past. And I prayed that for the things that I didn't know how to do, that God would give me the, the, the courage and the wisdom to learn how to do it. And the prayers were answered because God is real and God is faithful. And God does not leave us by ourselves and God gives us strength and courage if we ask for it and if we're open to it. The second lesson that I've learned is that time heals pain. Time heals pain. When I got here 10 years ago, I was less than two years removed from my mother's suicide. And I had a lot of pain, and it was real. And when that happens in a family, there's a lot of questions left unanswered, a lot of guilt, a lot of, if only we had, fill in the blank. But sometimes the only thing in life that can really heal our pain is time. Paul writes, we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. Paul also writes that we can boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. So if we can hold on to hope, then that's a good thing. I've always liked what Farrell said, that she sees her mission in life as one of bringing hope to other people. I like that. Whitworth Professor Jerry Sitzer says the soul is elastic. It's like a balloon, and it can grow larger through suffering. Loss can enlarge its capacity for anger, depression, despair, and anguish, all natural and legitimate emotions whenever we experience loss or pain. But once enlarged, the soul is also capable of experiencing greater joy, strength, peace, and love. Of course, I wish that our family had not had to go through what it went through back in 2005. But I do believe that as a pastor, it's given me a much better ability to resonate with people who have mental illness in their family or depression in their family or suicide in their family. And I've always said that, that if the church isn't in the healing business, then why are we here? If the church can't help people get through their pain, then what are we doing? And all of us have our own baggage, our own scars, our own hurt, and we have to process that and deal with that. But I do believe with all my heart that time heals all pain. And it doesn't mean that it goes away or that it disappears, but we learn to live with it. We don't get over it, but we get through it, and we become stronger because of it. I believe that. The third lesson that I've learned is that relationships are the foundation for life. The quality of our lives is directly tied to the quality of our relationships, which means that we need to choose carefully who we trust and who we spend our time with, it also means that we must work to cultivate relationships. Ecclesiastes 4 says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up the other. But woe to one who is alone and falls and does not have another to help. The church is about a relationship with Christ and it's about our relationship with each other. And if we're wise and if we look around today, this morning, there are people all around us that are looking for authentic friendships, deep friendships, not superficial relationships, but friendships that are grounded in mutual respect and trust. My dad pastored a church in Memphis for 35 years and he grew it tremendously and, and accomplished a lot in that time. That's where I grew up. But when I ask him what he remembers most about that time, you know what he says? Without a doubt, it's the relationships that matter most. Not the superficial relationships, but the deep relationships. The ones that are unconditional, where people are there for you no matter what. And these relationships take effort. Fourth lesson. I've learned that spirituality is very important. 
but it takes intentionality and commitment. It doesn't just happen. Jesus was grounded in the Spirit. He begins his ministry by saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. Jesus was in constant communion with God, and because of that, things did not rattle Jesus the way that they often rattle us. I think of Jesus as being cool, calm, collected. There's very few instances in the Bible where Jesus got angry. And when he got angry, he got angry. But Jesus took the time to pray. He took the time to go and be alone. He was open to the awe and wonder of life. Jesus was the perfect example of what it means to be spirit-filled. And in this busy, overcommitted world, we have to set aside time to fill our own cups. And I've actually had to learn that the hard way. Because whether or not you knew it, there have been times when I was completely spent, worn out, and I have to go and recharge and then come back. We can push ourselves and push ourselves so much that we get to the point where we have absolutely nothing left to give. And that's not a good place to be. We are in charge of making sure that our own cup is filled and that we are embodying the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness gentleness, self-control, the spiritual life will not just happen on its own. Fifth lesson, leadership is important and the hardest person to lead is yourself. We get in our own way. We get in our own heads. We get down on ourselves. We get mad at ourselves and it can become a, a terrible cycle Paul writes to the Romans, I don't understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. A healthy spiritual life begins with self-knowledge and self-understanding. And if you don't know yourself, then you're going to have a hard time relating to other people. In just a few weeks, we're going to offer a two-week series that I would encourage all of you to come to. It's going to be on Wednesday night, August the 30th, and Wednesday night, September the 6th. And it's called Understanding Yourself. And it's going to be presented by a guy named Ian Cron, who wrote the book called The Road Back to You. It's based upon the Enneagram. And the Enneagram gives you a basic understanding of who you are, what makes you tick, where you go in times of strength, and where you go in times of weakness. And not only is it important for you to understand your particular number on a one through nine scale, but to understand your spouse and to understand your family members and your kids, because that impacts uh, how you relate to them. So come to that series. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, but that first means that we have to love ourselves, and that also means that we have to first understand ourselves, and many of us don't understand ourselves. The sixth lesson that I've learned is change is inevitable, but growth is always optional. You see, everything in life changes. Nothing stays the same. Marriages change, jobs change, children change, our health changes. And we can either fight that or we can grow. Ecclesiastes says, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. And once we accept this reality that everything changes, we don't have to be afraid of change. I'm not saying that all change is good. I'm not saying that all change is something that we want. What I am saying is that things change. And we can choose to grow or we can dig our heels in, deny it, and be miserable. The church changes. Churches that don't change die. You heard the seven last words of the church? We've never done it that way before. And guess what? Change can be a good thing, a healthy thing, because without it, life gets boring and stale and routine and ordinary. We get stuck in ruts and we feel like we're living Groundhog Day, and that's no way to live. Change is inevitable, but growth is always optional. It's a choice that we have to make, and we should do everything in our power to grow every day. I've talked to you about the rule of five, John Maxwell's concept of five things you do every single day without fail to help yourself grow. 
Figure that out for yourself. What are the five things you need to do every day to help yourself grow? The seventh lesson. Forgiveness is a recipe for survival. I preached about forgiveness two weeks ago. Jesus said, forgive 70 times seven or 77 times. And forgiveness does not mean that we're okay with whatever happened. It does not mean that we have forgotten what happened. It simply means that we have decided to just move on and not let the past drag us down any longer. It's what Paul says in Philippians, forgetting what lies behind and pressing forward to what lies ahead. The past is gone. It's done. It's finished. We can't change it. All we can do is learn from it and move on. And so many of us are still holding on to situations from the past and we're the ones that are suffering. Let it go. Learn to forgive. Learn to ask for forgiveness. It's a Christian virtue. It's a recipe for survival and for living together in community. Nobody said that forgiveness is easy, but Jesus was clear that it's necessary Forgiveness simply allows us to lighten our load in life and then move on. The eighth lesson. We are in charge of our own inner peace. If we wait for the world or for others to give it to us, it simply won't happen. Remember what Jesus said in John's gospel, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives If you look to the world to find inner peace, you will not find it. If you watch cable news every night for hours on end, you're a fool. If you never turn off your phone or put it down, you might be addicted to it, just like you can be addicted to drugs and alcohol. We have to find our own inner peace and we have to put ourselves in situations where we can experience inner peace because we all long for inner peace. We all want inner peace. There was a group of psychologists who did a study one time and they identified eight ways to find happiness and inner peace. And really quickly, here's what they said. Number one, the absence of suspicion and resentment. Nursing a grudge was a major factor in not having inner peace. Number two, not living in the past. An unwholesome preoccupation with old mistakes and failures lead to depression. Number three, not wasting time and energy fighting conditions that you simply cannot change. Cooperate with life instead of trying to run away from it. Number four, force yourself to stay involved with the living world. Resist the temptation to withdraw and to become reclusive during periods of emotional stress. Number five, Refuse to indulge in self-pity when life hands you a raw deal. Number six, cultivate the old-fashioned virtues of love and humor, compassion and loyalty. Number seven, do not expect too much of yourself when there's too wide of a gap between self-expectation and your ability to meet the goals you've set, then feelings of inadequacy are inevitable. And number eight, find something bigger than yourself to believe in because self-centered, egotistical people score lowest on happiness tests. Inner peace only comes when we put ourselves in the right condition and when we make our minds up that we're going to find it and not just wait for it to come from outside situations or from other people. Because if we do that, we'll be disappointed. Lesson number nine. If you're struggling or feeling down, then go and serve somebody else. Some of the most powerful experiences that I've had at Woodmont have been in small groups and, and, and through mission opportunities. Guatemala was a life-changing event for me a few years ago, and I think there's still some spots this year if you want to go. Building a habitat house is a great experience. Hosting Room in the Inn is a great experience. Going down to Lake Charles, Louisiana to do a hurricane cleanup Back in 2008, I think it was that we went. That was a great experience. Going out on the food project trucks and serving uh, the, the, the people in our town that don't have anything, that's a great experience. And you know what? When it, when it came time to do a lot of these things, I wasn't always in the mood to do it. But after I did it, my mood completely changed. Now, Woodmont is a missional church with tons of opportunities to serve, both inside the walls and outside of the walls. 
So I would say take advantage of those. Saw the pictures in the spire this past week of our Morgan Scott group that went up and completely transformed a woman's house by taking an old kitchen and turning it into something that she was incredibly proud of. Rabbi Harold Kushner says, find someone else to help. Find someone you can take by the hand and guide to a better place. You will not only help that person, but you will help yourself. You will make yourself feel stronger by reaching out to somebody else. And St. Francis said, go and preach the gospel and use words only if necessary. The best thing that we can do when we're feeling down, frustrated, discouraged, is to go and serve somebody else. And lastly, this morning, the 10th lesson that I would share is that the Christian life is both challenging yet simple at the same time. Jesus summed it up. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on these two things hang all the law and the prophets. It's when we move away from these two commandments that things go wrong. We become selfish. We become angry. We become bitter. We get judgmental and self-righteous. We forget to be kind. We forget to be loving. We lose our patience. We feel like nobody's paying attention to us or thanking us for everything that we do. The prophet Micah raised the question, what does the Lord require of you? And then he answered it, do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with God. There's more to being a Christian than just being kind, but it starts there. Civility is important. Listening and understanding is important. Not always being suspicious of other people is important. We have to overcome pride and ego in order to discover what it means to live humbly. But Jesus summed it up, love God. And love your neighbor. If you're ever in doubt, go back to that. Love God and love your neighbor. And ask yourself, how well am I doing that? It seems so easy, but we know it's not. Treat others the way you want to be treated, the golden rule. If everybody did that, if everybody did that, the world would be a totally different place. Amen.